Welcome students to the hot and cold pre-lab and this pre-lab is designed to help you understand some important concepts that you're going to need to know for this lab and to help you with your lab write-up activity as well. As you might have guessed from the name, this experiment, this lab, is about energy or hot and cold reactions. Chemistry is the study of matter, energy and change. And this lab will focus on energy and classifying reactions as endothermic or exothermic. A chemist needs to know whether a reaction will give off heat or if it requires heat to occur. We've learned a little bit about endo and exothermic reactions already. Endothermic reactions are ones that absorb heat from the surroundings into the system. And in this way, heat is almost like another reactant. And we would see the heat term on the left-hand side. An exothermic reaction, on the other hand, is one that releases energy and heat into the surroundings, so from the system into the surroundings. And in that way, heat is given off just like a product. Some reactions that release heat or that require really specific temperatures in order to occur need to be controlled. And chemists can control these reactions by limiting the amount of reactants or in large scale reactants, chemical engineers design cooling systems for commercial sized reaction vessels. Heating and cooling jackets are essentially containers that are made of various materials and they work to precisely control the temperature of the contents. So there's lots of real life applications of exothermic and endothermic reactions. The purpose of this lab, the hot and cold lab, is to carry out four reactions at room temperature and identify each reaction as endothermic or exothermic. We will conduct each reaction in a styrofoam cup and we'll monitor the temperature before and immediately after the reaction to see if heat is released or absorbed by the system. The other purpose of this lab today is to learn how to make good observations and to clearly understand the difference between a qualitative and a quantitative observation. You'll be recording your observations in tables, which is uh, an important skill to learn. Let's talk a little bit about exo and endothermic reactions. In this lab, all reactions are carried out at room temperature, which means that the heat energy will come either from the system, the reaction itself, or from the surroundings. But we're not adding heat or cooling the reaction in any way. So when we measure the temperature throughout the reaction, it's really important to note that we're measuring the temperature of the surroundings. If you have a look at the diagram on the right hand side here, an exothermic reaction is one that releases heat or energy in the form of heat as the reaction carries, from, carries on from reactants to products. So in an exothermic reaction, if we observe the temperature, we should be seeing an increase in the temperature of the surroundings energy or heat has been released to the surroundings and we observe this increase in temperature as a result. Exothermic reactions happen around us all the time. More obvious examples are those that release energy in large amounts and may be accompanied by light and sound. Combustion reactions are great examples of, of exothermic reactions such as lighting a match or burning wood. Fireworks displays are beautiful examples of exothermic reactions where a rapid release of energy into the air causes a sonic boom and that's that loud bang that you hear. All of these reactions release energy into the surroundings and they're all exothermic. Some exothermic reactions happen around us all the time but they're not as obvious. Condensation collecting in the clouds is an exothermic reaction that involves a phase change from water vapor, a high energy phase of matter, to liquid water or rain, a lower energy phase of matter. Going from vapor to liquid releases energy which is lost to the surroundings, therefore it's an exothermic reaction. Freezing is also an exothermic process. Whether it happens outside or whether you make ice cubes in your, in your freezer, the physical change from liquid to solid involves a release of energy in the form of heat. And although those rea these reactions don't involve exciting explosions, they're still exothermic because heat is lost to the surroundings. Let's think about endothermic reactions. Endothermic reactions, as we move from reactants to products, absorb heat from the surroundings into the system. 
the temperature of the surroundings decreases as energy leaves the surroundings and it enters the system. In an endothermic reaction, energy is absorbed and it's used to break bonds or it's used as to be, or it's changed to stored potential energy in the products. A very common misunderstanding by students is that an endothermic reaction will get hotter as the reaction continues and the exact opposite is true. Endothermic reactions are happening around us all the time. Photosynthesis by plants is a great example of a reaction that requires energy from the sun to make the products, oxygen and glucose. Cold packs are a great example. A cold pack contains reactants that are originally separated, but when allowed to mix, they undergo an endothermic reaction, forming a product with more stored energy. The reaction absorbs heat from the surroundings, causing the surroundings to become very cold. So the cold pack works just like an ice pack with no freezing required. Other endothermic reactions, such as cooking an egg or boiling water, are common examples. These ones can be a little less obvious because they require heat to make them happen. They don't occur at room temperature because there's not enough heat available. And since we need to add heat, we don't observe the temperature drop that would otherwise be seen when endothermic reactions occur at room temperature. But all of these reactions absorb heat from the surroundings and they store that energy as potential energy in the products or that energy is being used to break chemical bonds. The other purpose of this lab is to learn how to make good observations and to understand the difference between a quantitative and a qualitative observation. Both types of observations are very important in chemistry because they give different but important information. You can see on the left hand side that a qualitative observation is one that you use your senses to observe the results. So for example, what you see, what you hear, what you smell. In chemistry, we don't encourage the use of touching or tasting chemicals to make a qualitative observation, but those would be qualitative observations as well. So qualitative observations could describe the appearance or the odor of the reactants, the products, and the chemical and physical changes that we observe throughout the experiment. And these observations help another chemist repeating the same experiment to know if they're getting similar results at each step in the procedure. So qualitative observations are ones that use describing words to describe what we see or what we hear or what we smell. Quantitative observations are ones that use numbers. These are results that are measurable. So whenever you record a, um, a measurement, that's a quantitative observation. They're made with instruments such as rulers, balances, graduated cylinders, beakers, and thermometers, uh, to name a few. So there is a difference between qualitative and quantitative observations, and those are important. Let's do an example here. We've got a solid. We might imagine that this is one of the, the reactants in one of our steps of our experiment. And if we were to make a quantitative observation of this solid, we would need to measure something about it. So for example, if we weighed it and we found that it had a mass of 3.56 grams, that would be a quantitative observation. To make a qualitative observation about the solid, I would need to describe it. And so we might say that it is a pink solid. Now this is a qualitative observation. It's just not a really great qualitative observation because it's not very descriptive. A pink solid could look, uh, look like a variety of different types of solid. It doesn't tell me anything about the consistency of the solid, whether it's flaky or it's powdery or it's crystal. Uh, it doesn't tell me much about the color pink, whether it's a bright pink or a dull pink or a dark pink or a light pink. So there's, um, there's a number of things we could do to improve this qualitative observation. Some of the things you might notice is that it is, uh, looks almost like sugar crystals and making a comparison is a great way to record a qualitative observation. We could talk about the color pink. It's a dark pink or a magenta pink. We could talk about the fact that it's uh, a little bit shiny. And so a better observation would be to say, this is a dark pink, hard, shiny, solid crystal. It looks like sugar. That would be a great qualitative observation. 
In this lab, you will record quantitative observations, such as the mass of a solid. Uh, you will also be taking temperature readings. So remember that when reading measurements from instruments that have graduated markings, like a thermometer, we can read down to the smallest division with certainty, and then we need to add a guess digit. The guess digit is an estimate, so your guess digit may vary a little from my guess digit, and that's totally acceptable. So here, on this thermometer, we can read with certainty down to the nearest degree, and we estimate to a tenth of a degree. So if you're looking at this thermometer, you might say that the, the thermometer is exactly at 19 degrees Celsius, or very close to 19. So we would record that as 19.0. That tenth of a degree is the guess digit. So I can read up to the 19 degrees with certainty, and then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say it is lying right at 19 degrees, so I'm just going to add 0 0.0 as my guess digit. Now you might add 0.1 or 0.2, and that would be absolutely fine. Um, somebody else might read this as 18.9, and that would also be totally acceptable. There, there will be a little bit of a range when we're reading any type of um, measurement off of an instrument that has marked divisions but it's really important that we do our best to read it precisely and that we add a guess digit. This lab is not going to require a full lab report because it's a learning activity, but you will record your observations in tables that will be provided to you. To help you remember which observations are qualitative and which are quantitative, we've given you a table for each. And later in this course, as you complete full labs, you'll want to create tables of your own and get used to making both types of observations. A couple of important things to notice about these tables are that the tables are numbered, table one, table two, and we've given them really clear titles. That's important whenever creating a table. We also put units in the headings of the table. So you'll notice here that volume of liquid has milliliters in the heading of the table, mass of solid, grams, degrees Celsius for the temperature, and instead of putting the units in every cell of the table, we've simply put them in the header. So any, uh, any readings that we record below will simply be the, the readings numerically. We'll, we'll put the numbers down, but we don't include the units again. And this is just a good habit of a scientist. Uh, and these are things that you will do later when you're asked to write a full lab report. That's it for the pre-lab video. Good luck and have fun with this lab.